I'm honest, my earliest music um, influences started when I was a little girl in Jamaica. Um, I, I was laughing the other day telling the story of when I was about six years old and uh, the blues beat would come through the village. You know, this is like, apparently they still do that, but I don't know if you know anything about this, but there's a sound system and the, um, that they have the w the way of playing music in the Caribbean, and there's sometimes competition, a little bit similar to today. The rappers, the way they do, that's uh, you know how they were doing it then. And um, I went. I wanted to go so badly to the to to the party, but of course I was only a child, so I sneaked out in the night <laughs> and went and went to the school where the party was 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 being held. You know and. Um, my aunt had to come and get me when they realized I was missing. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't missing. I only went to the party. So that was my first real, that thumping sound that comes from, you know, reggae music, you know, from uh, blues beat at, at the time. And of course, I was also influenced by a church music, you know, in, 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 when I go to church with my grandparents, I always sort of got influenced by the way they... They, they played the music and, and sang. It was just so infectious. It, was, it touched me. So that was my first experience. I don't know what the second question was. I forgot. <laughs> it was. So how did it evolve from there? How did your love of music evolve from there? Right. Um, so I came to England, uh, joined my parents uh, in, and my siblings here and went to school. And music was like in the 60s, really important. Uh, you know, so many great artists, uh, was on, you know, ready, well, whatever the name of the, 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 the music shows were. And um, we were not really allowed to watch too much TV at the time, but we, we heard songs. And I fell in love with the Motown. I also loved uh, some of the English uh, rock pop bands. And uh, we started a little group in, in school and that's kind of like how I got influenced into starting singing and thinking, believing that I could actually hold the tune. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and so who, who are the earliest people to kind of say to you, you know, you're, you're really great and, uh, and, you know, you should consider doing this professionally? Wow. Consider no one. <laughs> really? <laughs> no one, uh, no, no, not no one in my family anyway. They always told me to shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's sometimes the way. Um, but did, did you ever? Did did you think you know? I really want to do this professionally. You know, or did you have great ambitions and, and aspirations, or was it something that kind of evolved naturally? It it evolved naturally. I didn't think that any of this could happen to me. Um, my girlfriends and I, we had our little group in school and uh, we were lucky to, uh, to be able to perform every now and again in our community for different events that were happening in the community. Um, but uh, that wasn't really going anywhere. Um, I was discovered more or less by someone who what heard me in, a, in my mother's bar and um, I was singing to Sam Cooke. And uh, he thought, it, it was, he obviously thought that how could a young girl sing the harmony so easily to the song? Because I never ever sang like just a melody. If somebody's singing a song, I always pitched right into the harmony. So he asked if I could do some backing vocals for him. And I went and I met a lady who worked for an agency where she heard me sing and uh, asked if I could, if I wanted to go and audition, you know, for the show, but I was only 14. So my mom said I was still in school. So she called me when I was 17. And uh, that was the beginning of everything. So and was that show, was this when you auditioned for hair? That's right. Yeah. And you replaced Donna Summer. Well, I didn't, you know, it, it always comes out like I replaced yeah, Donna Summer, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it isn't exactly correct. Yes, she was in the same cast. I, it was a show in Berlin that I went to. She was performing in Munich, but I think she was originally in Berlin and they moved her to Munich because they created a new sort of like a new cast, you know, there was about four shows on tour um, in Germany. 
And I was actually understudying the Donna role, which gets really confusing because her name was Donna, but she wasn't the Donna in the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, I mean, were, were you a fan of hers? Uh, how big would she have been then, actually? No, we were we were close in 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 age. Um, I think she might have been about four years, maybe older than me, maybe four or five years. So I suppose you 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 eventually you know found success more or less at the same same time. We were walking a similar path, let's say, because yeah. uh, we were in hair together. Then um, we did some other musicals together. She did uh, the musical God Godspell. I don't know if you ever heard about that one. It was, but it was pretty successful in, in its time. And um, I did some other things. Then I joined this choir called the Les Humphrey Singers. And um, during the period of the Les Humphrey Singers, I think she was doing all of these other musicals. And then she joined a choir called Family Tree, which was similar to the Les Humphrey Singers. And um, after the Les Humphrey Singers, I had about uh, two years, two and a half years of literally a struggle, you know, uh, not knowing exactly which direction my life was going. And um, I remember Donna coming from Munich because she just had her baby, her first child. And, um, you know, she was in the family tree at the time. It was really quite um, interesting now when I look back on it because we couldn't have known where our lives were gonna go. Um, I mean, literally one year later, um, I, I moved back to England, I get a call, I go back to Germany, I meet Frank Farron, we start the work. And uh, at the same time, Georgia Morodo is working <laughs> with Donna. And um, her, I think her song came out before ours, I believe, before Daddy Cool. I'm not quite sure, but I think it did. And uh, she charted, we charted. It was just a crazy thing. And we both went Zoom. <laughs> yeah. All the way to the top, yeah. I mean, these records are so, some of the best, you know, that they're these days being reappraised and reevaluated and and kind mm -hmm. of regarded as as some of the best records of all time um, wow. they're, they're, they're some of the they're some of the um most infectious well produced mm -hmm. um, well put together records how how um you know looking back how influential was uh, frank farian on on your sound and um you know how much of a role did did he play well, Frank was very important, as Georgia Moroda was very important to Donna. You know, the producers yeah. in that time seemed to, they fed off of the artist. And uh, they were artists themselves as well. So uh, there was, um, I would say, love for music. We shared love for music. Um, when I met Frank, I, I remember that he <laughs> just really wanted to play music. And if he could, if he could be the music, if you know what I mean, I, he would have been he, he's that much in love with an all music, not just, um, you know, the music we produced. He loved everything. He loved, yeah. and this is why the, the I, you know, at the moment I'm looking at how I can let some people realize that our genre on the records, we're not just one. No. Uh, you know, we went right across the board, you know. Um, we did everything. He believed in music. He loved music and I love music, you know, I so so we complimented each other. So do you think do you think it's a common misconception that, you know, all, all of Boney M records are are, you know, disco records or or, you know, upbeat pop ones because because you've got so many smash singles that are like that? Well, I think that it's not even what the records that are a success suggests because if you think of rivers of babylon it's different to daddy cool yeah or mary boy child you know or different to rasputin so i think it's just in that that period um the people who sort of like um wrote about music uh didn't know which category to put us in so they just created one category and said they're a disco band yeah Do you understand? yeah because they didn't know how, where to put all the songs. But if you listen carefully, 
all the songs are it's reaching right across the world of music you know so when we were successful the idea of world music didn't exist yeah uh, you know what i mean it's an important, po it's an important point and mm -hmm. uh, it's a common a common misconception really mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not just with boney m with uh many artists yeah many many artists and many bands like even earth wind and fire i hear mm -hmm. People say, "Oh, Earth, Wind, and Fire are a disco band," and yeah, I think <laughs> world music is like a much better way of describing. Right, because you're covering so many genres, you know. Yeah, you've got so many influences, and, mm -hmm. and because of the experiences um, that you've already kind of outlined, some of your initial influences, mm -hmm. um, they must have all fed into your ability to carry all these genres differently. Well, yeah, uh, I think that um, coming from Jamaica as a child, uh, listening to gospel music and, and, and reggae music, and then arriving in England and becoming a British kid, going to school, listening to pop music. Um, then my, my father, he was a complete country Western man. So in our house, what we heard was Jim Reeves, you know. <laughs> so it was that kind of a oh. folk folk music that we we would sing at home you know gospel folk gospel um country and um then of course motown and 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 all of the american music that was influencing us going to when i went over to germany and then i discovered uh, um, also that there was another kind of music in germany i didn't even know that that music existed you know, which which is a music that would have influenced Frank, you know, the, sh the Schlager. I didn't know about that. So I discovered that when I went there and I realized it actually was really quite similar because it had a, a, a oomph feeling to the blues beat, you know, the blues, uh, the blues beat reminded me a little bit of the oompa music, the Schlager music, you know. So there was a connection. Music is connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of reductive, I guess. Genres, in a way, can often be very reductive. Yeah. And um, so, so how did you get to the point of, of recording Take the Heat Off Me, and which was, which was such a fantastic first record? Wow. Well, I, I cannot take any credit where the collection of the songs are concerned. I'm giving that all to Frank Farian. It was his original idea. Um, when I met Frank, we, uh, I was doing the show based on the Les Humphrey singers um, musical back, back in tracks because um, we didn't have any. Um, the only song that was introduced to me from Frank was the Baby Do You Wanna Bump song, which is, I think you may know this as the a track called Al Capone from yeah, Prince yeah. Arthur, right. So Frank covered this. This was actually very influential to me because as I said to you, when I was a little girl, those songs were very important, you know, would have been the kind of music that had me to leave my house when I was only six years old. So when I heard Frank um, re-recording this particular track, I was like, oh my God, you know, this is bringing me back home to Jamaica. And um, also when he convinced me to stay, and I listened to, to the song Fever and Sunny. I recorded those for him and they liked my sound. That was like the beginning of the idea. Not, we didn't know if anything was going to happen. Nobody knows when you go in the studio. And then we did uh, The Daddy Cool and everybody obviously loved that. And Marcy was singing uh, Take the Heat of Me and I think, um, um, loving the song, I think "Loving or Leaving," I think is the track, and um, you know I, I did "Got a Man in My Mind," "No Woman Will Cry," and uh, we thought we had an album, so off we went into the discotheques to promote it, and yes, in no time we had a number one hit. It was like um, something you know strange. We could not believe it. We didn't know that we were going to have uh, a, a second album. This was just a one hit wonder. So sorry. Can we break a minute? Oh yeah, no, no worries. Let, let me just close the door because there are movements going on here. One second. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, I'm sorry, I'm on the I'm doing interview. <laughs> yes, okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's my, I didn't close the door. It's my housekeeper. She's doing her bit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, okay, no, no, it's so, okay. So close the door now. So they shouldn't bother me now. Okay. And, and so where was I? So yeah, you were t talking about the first album and you know having having a number one hit. Um, with yeah. Dad and and that that kind of amazing change um, in your life. What what a you know moment of euphoria it must have been. Do you know it's crazy because you know I only now. Um, it, in my latter years, look back and think, wow, how, how did I just go along with all of this? Because mm -hmm. you don't take time to stop and think. Um, the only thing that, ex that you can actually get excited about is if your family says something to you like, wow, you know. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you just, you just, well, that's me anyway. I just kept going. And I was so happy when we had the second uh, hit, the second album. Um, you know, which um, obviously I hid from my parents because the sleeve was just so exciting. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> the love crazy. <laughs> if you actually think about the time, you know, <laughs> late seventies to have an album cover like that is crazy, <laughs> amazing, really cool. To, to, to I, I, we we talked yeah. about it, my husband and I. We talked about the psychology behind it because um, the 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 photographer and Frank, they just saw us as sexy babies, you know, which today is very normal. But in those days, that was like really unbelievable, you know? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a totally different time there, much more kind of conservative time. Mm -hmm. People easily forget that now because pop culture has almost- Excuse me, can you hear them? Can you hear so, anybody talking? Okay, good. I can't they're talking so loud out there. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's if you okay. can't hear them, that's fine. <laughs> I had I had yesterday I had some building works going on outside and the person that I was interviewing couldn't couldn't hear them. The, I think okay. the, the filter on Zoom is really good. So it's always oh, that's uh, great. Really good quality. So Okay, so, so you're gonna have to edit all of this. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> No, no worries, no worries. Uh, yeah, I'll make sure it's all edited smoothly. In terms of the um in terms of that change when you've started finding such huge success, um, how difficult was that to, to adjust to? And, and you mentioned that you didn't slow down. Did you become, you know, really fiercely ambitious to kind of maintain success? Because that's a very different challenge, isn't it? So yeah. Is, I don't even know if, if we were even conscious about uh, the plan of maintaining the success. I think what was happening, because you know, you know the history that only Marcy Barrett, myself and Frank Farron was recording and, yeah. and Maisie and Bobby always was ready. Well, they're part of the band to do the show. So that's how it was, how we were. Unfortunately, we didn't tell the world early enough, but that was how, but it worked for us, you know? And um, it wasn't like we knew that when we did the Love For Sale album that we were gonna have a hit record. It was just, luck if you know for me or blessings that it, that we had it because it doesn't always happen that way and um, of course when uh ma baker became such a humongous success and belfast it was like wow we've gotten a second year a second chance you know and um for me that was like especially you know ma baker the, the energy in ma baker was just yeah. for me so exciting and then uh of course belfast was speaking to the politics of the time and so we were like on a on a roll now and um the producer frank farren was excited this is taking him out of germany because before he would not have been known as a producer other than in germany so he was pretty excited the record company was a very small label and they were excited so there was a lot of excitement around us and I think I was a little numb if you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> just trying to figure out what's actually happening to us and just waking up every day and going with the flow wow yeah I mean <laughs> it must have been it must have been a really um monumental time in your life and uh and yeah. What one thing that's extraordinary is that you you kept following up one album after another, um, 
what you know one year after another you know night flight yeah. was, was next and that was only a year later and that mm -hmm. has you know two of your biggest hits on rasputin and rivers of babylon but in general it's a great album um i think it's probably one of the best albums we made uh night flight to venus and um Again, no one could have known that this was going to happen. Not Frank, as much as he may be, you know, known as a wonderful producer and has been able to pick hit songs. He's got good ear. Um, yeah. He could not have known. Uh, he, I, I remember him talking to me about Babylon and um, because, you know, there was, he didn't know the song and someone suggested it. People were always uh, suggesting songs and he would either say, yeah, this is a good song or no, I don't know if we can do this. Sometimes we record up to 30 songs before we actually broke it down to the wow. few songs that ended up. Yeah. So it was like a big, big uh, thing trying to get the right songs. And um, I remember <laughs> the discussion about Brown Girl in the Ring because I didn't particularly want to do that song because <laughs> it was so childish. And, you know, I, I couldn't believe it when it became a hit. It's like, how could, no one expected this to be a success, honestly. Um, <laughs> if, any, if any song on that rec, on that album was going to be a success was a song that Marcia sang, sang um, uh, what was it called? Um, Don't Change Lovers in the Middle of the Night. Oh, yeah. never, never change your lover. You know that one? Yeah. And Marcy was singing that. So I, I genuinely thought that was going to be the hit because it was such a funky song, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I kind of wished that I had it to, <laughs> to sing, you know? Not Brown Girl in the Ring. I wanted to be the diva. <laughs> so, so what was it like, you know, what's it like in the studio um, for you? You know, how, how was... How, how was the kind of process? Um, was it was it quite, was it, I mean, you mentioned recording 30 songs. So it, it, did you did you spend a long time working on the albums or, or were they? Yes, we did. Each, each album, we've always spent at least three months to four months on an album. Wow. Yeah. And is that is that all continuous? Is that like, you know, pretty long days and stuff working on a record? Very long days, right into the middle of the night. Wow. Yeah. And so is, is that because the, the, the process of recording the vocals is, is quite involved or were you there as well for throughout the, the whole process? You we, know? Marcy and I was never really there for the soundtrack when they were laying the tracks of musicians and they weren't always there together either. Um, different musicians would come in on different days. Yeah. Um, so like the guitarist may come in on a day all by himself and uh, he would lay his, his parts according to what was required of him. Right. We had uh, musicians from, you know, from Sweden, from Holland, from, because there were all session musicians all over the place. So they would come in when they had time according to the sessions. And uh, so once the, the demo backing tracks were finished, that's when um, and you'd we in. would come in and uh, lay the vocals. And once we, we laid the vocals and we could see where we're going, then Frank Fran would go back and maybe do some more work on the music, change a few things here and there. And yeah. most of the times actually, he would end up telling me that he would take the first recording, even though we would have gone back into the studio and tried to do a proper recording, what was considered a proper recording. But he always ends up taking the first recording because it says it's always fresh well yeah, yeah i can i can imagine that so in terms of mm -hmm. in terms of the melodies that, that you sang mm -hmm. um how pre-planned were they or did you kind of come in and and sort of you know because they they call them now like top line writers you know because like songs songs these days are written by like 15 people and they have special people just to write the top line for the artist. And it's all a, a different proce process. Completely different process. I, I don't know if, we, if I can. Uh, it's so different. Um, yeah. in, in our day, a songwriter, somebody wrote a melody and uh, they would uh, offer their melody because they want someone to record if the person who's writing the song is not an artist themselves. 
yeah. uh, then obviously they're looking for somebody to sing their song. Yeah. So if Mr. Farian, for instance, feels that he likes the melody that's coming from that person, then he would uh, say, okay, fine, we can work with this melody. So with that melody, obviously, uh, the musicians are then laying a track and uh, there would be a lyricist or, or somebody who writes a lyric. There was one guy by the name of Fred, ja Fred Jacobson. If you've noticed his name on all our records, he's written so many of our songs. He was the one who he wrote for Ray Charles, lyrics for Ray Charles. And wow. uh, when a child is born, he wrote those lyrics um, for Johnny Mathis. So he was a great songwriter and he's a lyrics, lyricist. And he spent a lot, I spent a lot of time with him in the studio as we were re recording the songs, we were writing the lyrics as we go along. Wow, and yeah, mm -hmm. so because that was one one thing that I wanted to touch on, because as well as as um, the records being so well produced and so melodically strong, one of the mm -hmm. things that's really interesting, and perhaps you know even with some of the the, the most like catchy of your songs, mm -hmm. the lyrics are, uh, are quite different to mm -hmm. some things that were released, <laughs> and and that's mm -hmm. sometimes they they they're more uplifting, sometimes they're more entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, did, did, you, did you think that, that that's helped the song's longevity? Yeah, there's got to be truth. Um, and also, um, I think that a lot of the songs are very um, real. So yeah. if, if I think of Daddy Cool, Daddy Cool does exist in so many ways in people's lives. Um, even if there was a Daddy Cool in, in, in the US at the time, you know what I mean, who wore that that hat and, and, and the gold chain and did his thing. Uh, the point is that Daddy Cool can be your daddy. It can be yeah. your uncle. It can be, you know, it's just such a cool name for somebody who's influential in your life. And I think that's one of the things with the music of Barney and that was so strong is that there was some realness to it, some truth, you know. Ma Baker, that bad lady you know who runs the house i mean many people have a lot of ma bakers in their lives <laughs> yeah for you sure <laughs> stuff that everybody could relate to right and how did it how did it feel um when you know decades later you see these songs kind of still being played on the radio all the time um probably used in ad i don't you know I don't know, but you in must ads, get, yeah. they've been using requests. ads. <laughs> you probably get requests all the time saying, can we use this for ads? Like, and uh, and that, that probably leads to, to more fans discovering you because you're like, you know, before I knew, I thought Daddy Cool came out in like the 90s. Before I, <laughs> before I you know, before I grew up and I, I really started delving into music and buying records, mm -hmm. I thought Daddy Cool came out in the, in the 90s. It shows you that, that you know, these are songs that... that you know, we as kids were singing in the 90s. The kids will be singing these songs now. You know, they're, they're, yes. they're part of history. How does that make you feel? And did you expect that at the time? Did you think, God, we've made some of the classic all-time records? Gee whiz. At the time, you have to know, in the 70s, because also because our image, you know, were of black people, we're black people. So there were black people who were saying, oh, they're so kitschy or they're so, they're so light. You know, everybody wanted us to be more, more heavy. And yeah. um, there, were, there was this feeling of, on the radio, sometimes people thought that we were not, we were too um, commercial, you know, yeah. too light. So there was a lot of criticism, yet the records were being bought. But the people who were behind the music scene, a lot of the DJs and things like that, always found something to say like, well, yeah, but it's still, it's, it's not going to last, you know. And so when you ask me the question about how do I feel now, it's like, it's still amazing for me because I didn't hear at the time when we made the music that we were, um, that we were in the, the, the group of people that lasted if you know what I mean. Yeah. That's how it sounded to me. But maybe I wasn't hearing the right people. <laughs> must be even more satisfying in that sense. Um, and did, did, did criticism get to you? Because often people that are incredibly popular and successful um, do face criticism. Were you able mm -hmm. to brush it off easily? Was the fact that you were, must have been having a, 
you know, in many ways a great time and, and, and enjoying success. Um, was it easy to brush it off or was it hard? Um, actually, I've always been the kind of person that never really allowed myself to get too show busy. You know, I was never reading too many articles about myself or about the group itself. And I'd never really watched myself <laughs> when, when we did a show and then listened to the critics. So it didn't really affect me as it would a lot of, of other artists. Um, I do not know quite if the rest of my colleagues, how much of it they watched and listened to, but I think that they probably um, complained a bit about the way people responded uh, to, to our music, but it never really, never really bothered me that much. And um, I was probably um, the over grateful person, you know, I was just very happy that God had made a way and that, I had a chance to sing some songs and that some people actually found it good. Even though some people thought maybe it was too kitschy, I still thought, okay, you know, I did something. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't realize what we did and how far and wide it went until way in the 90s. Um, throughout the 70s and the 80s, it, I didn't clock it. I didn't realize it. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it, it, it's, it's, it's timeless music and, and, and it yes. will last forever. And at, at the time, because you we would have been so busy making, you know, these fantastic records and, um, you know, having a career of your own. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, who, who are some of the artists of the day? Because for me, the 70s is the best, the <laughs> best decade of music. I don't think that it will ever be repeated in popular music. Um, <laughs> I don't see how it could be. I and for me, the for me, the fifties and the sixties are the best. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I guess everybody, you know, has has nostalgia for a certain. Even, I mean, it's not like I'm not thinking we, what we did was good, but it's just that you don't look at yourself or your work in that same kind of uh, way. Well, because uh, your if work, you're modest, right? You don't. Uh? If you're modest, you don't. You know. <laughs> 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 you think I'm modest? No, I genuinely don't look at my work like that. I, I, but but I have to admit that um, people have sort of helped me to realize that the music is lasting and will never go away through performances when I go to do shows and what people have to say, and then I would get messages from people from all walks of life, whether it is the the behind China, you know, it's that far away, or, yeah. you know, in the, in the deepest part of the, of, of the South of, of, of America, wherever people have heard the music, I'm getting some mail saying thank you. So I do know that it has gone around the world and um, has made a lot of people very happy. Yeah. I, sure. I, I know that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, in you know, in terms of that era, who, are there any other acts that you think you, that you remember enjoying at the time or that you've enjoyed since who, who you would compare to, to yourself? <laughs> you know, I bet you're going to say Abba. <laughs> you uh, were I, I Abba. wasn't even going to say Abba. I love, I, I love Abba, though. I love Abba. But and you know, and you because that's the question. Abba on the same that's the question place. always puts to me because we were sort of like successful together, you know. Yeah. And um, interestingly enough, the year um, that we were, Abba, Boney and Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson was moving in that period as well with his brothers still. And, um, you know, there were so many, there were so many groups, pop groups, you know, that was in, in this period. Who, and some of them are still, are probably still active, um, mm -hmm. you know. But I think Abba was the one group that, we walk together musically yeah well i mean and they're they still are. very active their music i mean their music yeah for sure mm -hmm. i mean yeah. do you think there should be a boney m musical or has there, there was there was frank farian tried to do one and um i think he would have been successful with it had he understood the fans of boney m but i think that what we're talking about, the, 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 what the music of Bonnie means to the fans across the world. I don't know if, like I said, I didn't understand 
the power of it until I started touring in the 90s. And then I saw something completely that blew my mind. So if my mind was blown in, 19, in the 70s and in the 80s, trust me, it was blown more in the 90s. And I think that was something he didn't understand. Yeah. So the, where, the, where, he, where he allowed the writers to write a, the play, the story he put behind it, unfortunately, was not complementary to who Bonnie M is. And I think that's why his musical didn't work. Well, ho hopefully someone will have another go. I'm sure they will. Although, you know, at the moment, <laughs> theatres are obviously, you know, not doing too well. No, not right now, but it'll come back. But they will, they will come back for sure. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, so it's interesting that you, that you compare, um, compare yourselves to ABBA in a way, but yeah, they're, they're fantastic. I love ABBA and, and loads of people do. And there's, I don't think there's any of that stuff anymore about, about, um, you know, Boney M music or ABBA music or, you know, all, most of the acts from the 70s, no matter what the genre is, whether it's like, you know, the beginnings of metal with Black Sabbath or whether, mm -hmm. whether it's pop like ABBA mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's, you know, the many genres that Boney M encapsulated, mm -hmm. most of this music is now treasured. Um, and so um, one of my final questions for you is, um, do you have some deep cuts, you know, some like, songs that weren't the smash hits like Rasputin or Rivers of Babylon and things like this um, mm -hmm. that you kind of really treasure that you think you'd love my listeners to, to check out, you know, because right. sure my listeners will have heard your music at every single party that they've been to probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are songs that weren't hits, um, that weren't even A-sides. Um, when I think about uh, what we're going through at the moment, the changes, especially um, finding ourselves as black people in the West, um, there's a song on, um, I'm not sure if it's, um, if it's Oceans of Fantasy, it's called African Moon, it's a little reggae song. Yeah. Have you listened to it? Have you yeah. heard it? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a song I think is very actual right now for the, the yeah. pressures that uh, the people that were taken from Africa, you know, like myself, I, do, I mean, not now, but then 400 years ago. So the song is kind of like talking uh, to that. And I think a lot of people don't even know that we, we, we covered even that area, if you know what I mean. So the music yeah. of Bonnie M went into all of, of life. And yeah. maybe we could play that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it. I think it really sums up um, the you know the part the the side to Boney M that um, you know fewer people know and and should mm -hmm. people and find out. Well, Liz, thank you very much um, for taking the time to do this. I really really appreciate it. And my final question is: um, Do you do you listen to modern music at all? And uh, you know, are there any artists that uh, that you like that you hear on the radio or or elsewhere? I actually am, I'm completely lost at the moment where music is concerned. Um, I try to enjoy a little bit of, of uh, well, hip hop, you know, my son is into that. So he uh, introduced me to, of course, to Kanye West and to uh, Beyonce and, and all of this, that side of, of, of things. And he, and at the moment, apparently he said to me, Afrobeat is really, really big. And oh, apparently, geez. funny enough, one of the young boys from the, the church I attend is one of the big producers. <laughs> right, right. And I didn't even realize, you know, so they are. That's so, amazing. Um, yeah. So, so the music is still around me, all around me. And at the moment, I have, there's a whole bunch of young people coming my way because I've got the charity where we pay attention to younger folks. So... Maybe you'll hear something from me very soon. 